so good to see everybody here this morning. I always find that that uh, 50 minutes between the end of Sunday school and the start of the service is never long enough. I want to just keep talking with everybody and, and sharing our stories and uh, sharing how our weeks have been. Uh, we get this time now to come to the Lord in prayer. And as, as always, it's very, I find just a, an important time for me. Even though I'm praying throughout the week, this time with you is special. It's a special time where we're able to bring these concerns that we have. And uh, we pray in many different ways, and we pray throughout our... Do, does everybody pray throughout the week? Don't want to look for a show of hands. People are like, oh man, is it, would it be wrong to lie about this? You know, uh, should I, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, pray in different ways, right? Do, do, uh, how many people pray when they're exercising? Does anybody do that? Does anybody do that? When I'm walking, you can get really honest prayer when you're walking. Uh, does anybody pray when they're driving? <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially in Winnipeg. Um, uh, is it, no, no sh sh I should be asking, does anybody pray when they're in the car with somebody that is present in, in, in our sanctuary this morning? No, but we pray, we pray when we're driving. Do you find that you have really honest prayer when you're doing that? When you're kind of alone in your car and you can just really talk out loud, you feel like you're just having a conversation with God. One of the things that I've noticed in my prayer life in the last little while is the importance of silence. We are a very productive community. We always want to do things. We want to be working at things. We even want to work at our relationship with God. And God's like, you know what? I've got this. I've got the relationship. You don't have to work at it. What I want you to do is rest in it. I want you to relax. And one of the most important things in your prayer time, I would really encourage you this. It has to, I would encourage you guys to say that it needs to get beyond five minutes of silence. The first four, four and a half minutes are probably, the first five minutes, are you just trying to stop being distracted with all the things that you need to do. But take time uh, in your prayer for silence. We're going to introduce that a little bit uh, into our prayer time this morning. You notice that I often do that, is take time for silence. It's important to just quiet your heart before God. To just be in His presence, ask for nothing but just to be with him. So we're going to do a little, bit, a little bit of that this morning. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. Now I got to tell you, you know, you're going through, uh, when you're going through a biblical text, it's surprising when certain you kind of think, I don't want to preach on this. This is kind of something, you know, what's, what's going to be the challenge here? What's going to be the practical application? And the topic that I looked at, you know, when I opened up the scriptures on Monday or Tuesday morning, it was uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17, which is about fasting. And I'm thinking, hold on, now we're coming up to Thanksgiving. You know, kind of an odd thing, you know, should I even preach on this? And then I realized that God does have a message for us today, something that's really important um, and it will come through the sermon title, Fasting and Feasting, or Feasting and Fasting. These are actually two sides of the same coin. And I didn't realize it until I started reading through this. And uh, I think that you'll probably see it fairly quickly, how the two are connected. So Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed." But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Let us pray. Holy God, open up the word to us this morning. Lord, we are in need of your direction, your instruction, your guidance. Lord, help us to feast on your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many people here like to travel? Are there any travelers? Yeah, wow, there's a lot of travelers. How many people don't like to travel? 
Yeah, okay. You and me are together. Just you and me. We'll stay home. We'll send our wives out somewhere. We'll, we'll party together. So yeah, so some of you guys love to, tra- love to travel. You travel all over the place. I know because in the wintertime often there's a lot of people gone. Uh, you guys like to travel. You've been to many different places around the world. You have flown. You have cruised. You have drove. You have bussed, motorcycled I'm sure too, uh, both into both urban and rural locations. Now you can probably tell me about amazing sights you've seen and how you toured some ancient ruin. You will have taken pictures of mountains, oceans, sunsets, waterfalls, caves, and animals. And, you know, when I come over to your houses, I often see all of these things. You know, you get to see the picture tour. But I have found that when we get beyond the photos, once we've kind of seen the hour or two of of photos that you have taken of all of these different locations, and we sit back and we sit down to relax over coffee, one of the interesting things are the things that is most memorable, and I see this in most people that are sharing their, uh, their vacation time, is the food that they ate. Really. Often they, they'll, talk, they'll talk about after all these amazing things, oh, I had this, this great food, or, man, the food there was terrible. It becomes a highlight of the trip. It be, leaves a lasting impression. I noticed while, while we may ooh and all over pictures that it's what someone eats that really elicits strong emo- memories and our responses. Angela and Rolf were right to bring some of their Ethiopian delicacies to the front of the church to show us the raw meats and organs that Joel ate. And we, the audience, had this clear, visceral response. You know, when when I'm watching uh, everybody else, I wasn't watching what was happening up here, but everybody else's response to seeing, I think it's called tripe, which is cow stomach, right? And then there was liver, I believe. Now it's raw. And that's how they would, they would normally eat it. So it's on the skewer. And I don't think it's going to quickly leave my mind the idea of there being um, um, tripe and, and, and uh, liver on a skewer in my pulpit. You know, that this was right here, this kind of food. And this is stuff that they ate. When someone gets, goes to a, uh, to a culture made relatively similar to our own, say the Caribbean islands or some sandy beach destination, they still remember and appreciate the food, the fruit. You know, it's funny, but the food that we eat can make or break a trip. Isn't that true? If you had really bad food on a trip, no matter how many good things you saw, you remember how bad it was. You remember how how that disrupted it. However, if you have great food, that often becomes that central memory of something that was really great. We in Canada are so fortunate because we have an abundance of food all year round at the grocery store. We can also go to the local buffet anytime we want and enjoy an amount and variety of food that kings of the past would have been astounded by. I wanted to show you a picture of the largest buffet in the world, uh, I, but uh, it would have been a 360 view, and I didn't know how we'd even do that. It's down in Las Vegas. Now, some of you have probably been to it. I can't remember the name. It's Carnival or something like that. It's this huge buffet of food. The kings of the past, friends, would not have half of the food that we eat on a normal basis, let alone a buffet, where you see foods from all around the world cooked to perfection. And every so often, we as a community gather around our own dining room tables and feast on the very best foods, hopefully remembering to be thankful to God who's graced us with so much. Feasting is a response to the blessing of the abundance of God. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to have abundance. It's a good thing to be thankful for abundance. But if we continually feast and never stop, what does feasting turn into? It's one of the seven deadly sins. Gluttony. It's a strange thing, right? Because we live in a culture where we can have whatever we want, and we can have as much of it as we want. There's other cultures that would you agree that don't have what we have? Even other cultures that would be considered part of the developed world, not third world, first world countries, don't have what we have. We are some of the wealthiest people in all of the world, in all of history. And I would say this, in Rosenord, in our little community, and even in Canada, we are the wealthy. And we have to be careful that in our celebrations of thanksgiving that we don't turn into always wanting more and always desiring more and and turning thanksgiving into really gluttonous, a gluttonous always, always feasting 
always feasting. Is there a way that we can feast well? Yes, there is a way we can feast well. Has God given us something that we can do in our lives that will help us feast in a godly way? Yes, there is. It's called fasting. Have you ever noticed how, how wonderful food tastes when you haven't eaten for a while? Have you ever noticed, have you ever gone on a diet? Some of you guys maybe have done this. You go on a diet of like vegetables and, uh, you know, you're just eating these vegetables and then you get to eat a piece of fruit, an apple, and it's just, it's the sweetest thing. Yet when you're feasting all the time, that that apple sounds kind of like, ah, I don't want apple, I want the peanut butter pie. You know, that apple, who, who needs that? I want, I want something bigger. But feasting helps kind of, or fasting helps prior, or put our minds and our hearts and our bodies in the right place to be able to feast well. I would suggest that as we come to the Feast of Thanksgiving, it's good and right for us to consider the substantial spiritual and physical benefits of fasting as a way of preparing for feasting, as both are means by which we can worship God. This morning, we're going to look at our passage, Matthew 9, 14 to 17, to see how Jesus ordered feasting and fasting, which when applied to our own situation, will help us participate rightly in both of these blessings. Turn with me to verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him. We're being introduced to a new group of people here. We've been dealing with Pharisees and disciples. We've been reading how each group engages with the Messiah. The disciples of Jesus are listening and hopefully applying what they're learning. Pharisees are Jews who are not really engaging with Jesus' teaching. They had a lot of power, a lot of influence. They didn't appreciate what Jesus was doing, which was turning the people from living by a uh, religious system and turning to serve God in personal relationship. Now we have another group coming on the scene who, through the connection that John has with Jesus, are kind of on the same level with the other disciples and the Pharisees. They're able to kind of get in there and ask these theological questions. Being disciples of John didn't mean they had greater knowledge of who Jesus was uh, any more than the people that had been around Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. What they did know, that Jesus was from God, and as John had declared, came to save people from their sins. But how he was going to do this, where, when, John's disciples didn't know. In fact, instead of becoming one of Jesus' disciples, they continued to follow John. The rest of verse 14 reads, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Now, we're not surprised here that John the Baptist and his disciples fast. John is the kind of guy that you'd expect these really spiritual disciplines from. He's no stranger to challenging his body as a way of testing his spirit and encouraging devotion to the Lord. And hey, if I was eating locusts and honey, I'd want to fast too. And so his disciples, his followers, also seem comfortable with fasting as a spiritual discipline, as a spiritual practice. That John's disciples associate themselves here with the Pharisees who are also fasting, almost teaming up with them, it seems, reveals that the reputation of the Pharisees in the culture isn't as bad as we always make it out. Like, obviously, we've got Jesus' kind of viewpoint that we're looking at the Pharisees from, but here we've got these disciples of John, and they're kind of saying, hey, why do the Pharisees and we fast? Why do we both do this? Okay, so they're, they're kind of associating themselves with the Pharisees. They're saying, look, the Pharisees do this, and we do this. It's like you don't team up with someone you don't like. You don't, you don't kind of challenge a kind of, kind of behavior and, and team up together unless you respect somebody. You respect somebody, you want to be on their team. Well, it kind of looks like they're being on the same team here. Um, these Pharisees were well known in the area of fasting, being very committed to it. They fasted twice a week. That was kind of Pharisaical practice, far beyond anything the Old Testament required. John's disciples were probably fasting in a similar way, Although people say maybe not as often, but as consistently. So maybe once a week they were fasting uh, every week. John's disciples question Jesus because they are watching Jesus' disciples not fasting. And my guess is that they're wondering if these people just aren't that religious, right? Here we are doing all this fasting. Why is it you guys aren't fasting? You know, this is the right religious practice. This is what religious people do. They fast. Are you really committed to God? Uh, Jesus answers John's disciples by asking a question and at the same time drawing a comparison to a wedding. Verse 15 says this, 
And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Now, I want you to think, about, uh, think back to the last wedding you attended. Think about, think about back to the last wedding you attended. You remember that you dressed up in your fancy clothes, that you primped yourself, you're doing your hair, shining shoes, making yourself look your very best, like you belonged at the wedding. If you were part of the wedding party, you took this to a whole other level, so you looked immaculate. Now, after the ceremony, after all the work was done, and after the pictures, what comes next? What comes after the pictures and the wedding? Oh, I thought everybody had this one. It's food. That's the answer. It's food. That's what comes next. The eating comes next. Everyone looks forward to the meal, right? I, I've, never been to a, I've never been to a wedding where I wasn't like, man, I wish the pictures would stop <laughs> so we can get to the food because I'm really, really hungry. Um, that is what the guests are all looking forward to. They're all looking forward to finally sitting down and eating. This is the image that Jesus is using to help John's disciples understand why his disciples do not fast. You see, while the bridegroom, Jesus, the one who loves his church, his bride, is here with his bride, why would there be fasting? Can you imagine going to, your we going to a wedding and at the meal, um, there's whole, uh, whole tables of people, those nice round tables, whole tables of people that have said no to all the food and are sitting down and, and on their knees and praying. Think about it. Literally, think about this. Jesus is wanting to get this kind of image across. So you go into the wedding, uh, you're, you're kind of coming into the reception hall, you come in and you notice all these people not eating and praying. You might think that there's something wrong, you know, because that's not what you do at weddings. So, so somebody, does, you'd be like, are, do you not agree with this wedding? Is this not a good thing? Are you praying for them because you're worried for them? Like, what's going on? No, while the, uh, the parents of the bride and groom would be happy to pay for less food, it might make you wonder if the guests were really supporting this. What should be happening is rejoicing with food and well wishes. While Jesus is with his disciples as bridegroom, the disciples, as any other wedding guests on a wedding day, don't fast, they feast. They go to the wedding and they feast. That's the right thing to do. But the image changes, uh, goes on or continues on in verse 15, which makes plain that there will come a time when they should fast. The day will come, it says, uh, when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. Now, I want you to think of another event, a funeral. Now, here as well, people get dressed up in their finery, their best clothes. We take care of how we look. But instead of festivities and pictures, it's quiet, right? It's reflective. And yet again, after the service is over, maybe after the graveside is over, graveside service is over, what do we do? We eat. We do the same thing. It's interesting how, how funerals and weddings kind of actually are very, very similar in that way. The way we process through them as people. It's the time for the guests to eat. They're hungry, but the meal is a much more subdued affair. And depending on who the funeral is for, the mourning may be so deep that those closest to the deceased cannot eat. Would that, would that be a true statement? Have you ever been so, uh, maybe no, I'm thinking of a funeral, but maybe there's a case where you've been so sad or so upset that there's not a way a piece of food could pass into your mouth. You just can't eat. Okay, well, that's the kind of fasting that Jesus is talking about here. Imagine with me for a moment what would happen if on a wedding day, on a wedding day, on the way to the reception, the bridegroom was killed in an accident. I know, I, I, believe me, this is a terrible thing, and I'm not, I didn't want to write it, but this is what Jesus is talking about. On the way to where the wedding or the marriage is going to, is completed, consummated even. On the way, the bridegroom is killed in an accident. What was supposed to be a grand wedding feast would change in an instant. What would have been an appropriate celebration when the bridegroom was still alive would rightly change to what? To fasting, not feasting. It was a feast, and it was right while the bridegroom was with them. But when the bridegroom is taken away, that food, no, now it's fasting. How inappropriate it would be if the guests at the wedding celebration decided to keep feasting when they heard the news of the death of the bridegroom. 
Jesus knows that his life is going to be taken by the Jews. Jesus knows that he'll not be able to stay with his bride until the final consummation. And there, is great, there will be great sadness. It's during that time when he is gone that Jesus' disciples will fast. Fasting because they're grieving the loss of Jesus. However, Jesus also knows that his disciples and all Christians that follow them will be in a special situation because while his disciples are sad that they don't have Jesus with them physically, they would also know that one day he will be returned to them. In a sense, guys, we're kind of sitting in between the final celebration of a wedding. So Jesus uses this image. We're the bride. He's the bridegroom. On the way to the consummation of the wedding, to the final where things are finally completed and the wedding is completed, on the way, he's taken from us. And he dies. Now he's resurrected and goes to be with the Father. But you can anticipate, we're in anticipation of being back with our bridegroom. We are the bride. We're looking forward to being with him. That's the image here. And in this time, and as we wait in anticipation of that day, we fast, but we fast in anticipation. Our fasting isn't like it was in the past. It's not in a complete grieving, but a fasting, kind of a way of preparing our hearts in anticipation of being with him. And we're going to look at that a little farther along. Jesus then makes a second and third comparison between the old ways of Jewish practice, Jewish fasting, and the new ways he's instituting. Read with me verses 16 to 17. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved." I don't know, but this, this one had me scratching my head. I'm sure that a lot of people there were probably going, what are you talking about? Not sure what you mean. Well, these two little parables pick on this up on a, on a theme of a new and joyful pattern of religion that Jesus ushers in, which is incompatible with the old pattern, the old religion of law and duty that the legalists followed. Much of the life of the Pharisees was spent doing religious things to gain the favor of God. They did things, legal things, so that God would look at them in a special way to gain his favor, to earn commendation by making sacrifice and observing spiritual discipline. But a, t uh, a time had now come in Jesus when it was made clear that God's grace was all sufficient for making one right before God. Nothing else was needed. As a result, anything we would do for God would be in thanks and response for what God had first done. The change is a subtle one, and it's really hard to detect. Because you could have the Pharisees fasting, and you could have Jesus' disciples fasting, uh, say after Jesus had, been, had died and resurrected. They're both fasting, and they both look like they're doing the same thing, but are they? They're not. One is trying to earn merit with God, and the other is doing it as a remembrance and a way of coming closer to God. It's a way of connection. It's, a, it's coming from a transformed heart. In the first parable, the scriptures say it was unshrunk cloth that was the issue. But it is literally, or better translated, unfold cloth. The reason they don't translate it unfold cloth is because most of us wouldn't know what that meant. A fuller unfold cloth, so something cloth that a fuller had taken care of, a fuller was a person who cleaned and combed cloth to remove the natural oil and gum that was present and then bleached it ready for using in making garments. And in that process of doing this, the garment shrunk. It would come down, the fabric would shrink. In this way, it would shrink and when washed, when washed, and so it would have a disastrous effect if this new piece of cloth was put on an already shrunk garment. In the second parable, we're introduced to the idea of wineskins. Has anybody drank from a wineskin? Anybody, anybody skins of animals? I wasn't sure. I, I was hoping Joel was going to be here, so I'm sure that he would be able to say yes to that. He's drunk from a, a, an animal skin. I personally never I used a wineskin of any sort, although I've seen them being used in those old westerns on TV. You, they always seem to, to have them. Wineskins in biblical times were made from the skin of goats or goat bladders that had been treated into a nice supple leather, just like some of those nice leather boots that you've bought that are really flexible at the start. They're kind of like that, uh, that you might purchase today. 
And as with boots, over time, the leather of a wineskin, which was at first nice and soft and flexible, becomes brittle and hard. Now connect that with the fact that what happens in the, uh, connect that with what happens in the fermentation of wine. And you get a problem when newly made wine is put into old wineskins. In very general terms, wine fermentation occurs when yeast consumes sugar and converts it into approximately half alcohol and half what? What's the other byproduct? People are going, I don't want to tell anybody that I know about wine fermentation. <laughs> the other part is CO2. So you have half alcohol and half CO2 being produced uh, by weight, so, which is really important because while the weight of the uh, wine and gas remain the same, right, because it's being turned into gas, what happens to the volume? The volume increases, right? And what happens to that skin? So you put this new wine that hasn't fermented really fully yet, and you put it into the wine skin and you close it, what happens is that process, that chemical reaction keeps happening and the volume increases. And if it's an old, brittle, leather uh, sack, it explodes, right? Makes sense, like a balloon. That's what's happening. So that's what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about these old wineskins. That little flexibility would eventually burst uh, instead of continue to, to expand. So John's disciples are asking why Jesus' disciples don't fast as they do, as the Pharisees do. The reason by these little parables is easy to discern. Jesus Christ in the gospel that he preaches is the new wine and the new fabric. The legalistic ways of the past are the old skins or the old garment. What Jesus is suggesting that the new thing, the gospel, is so radically different from the previous ways of embodying a relationship with God that it would be irre do irreparable damage to Christianity and Judaism and neither would survive if the gospel was simply add added to legalistic ways. Is this not true in your own experience? If you take Christianity and you try to add to it a legalism, what happens to the joy of any of the people in that church? It plummets. Legalism and Christianity, legalism and the religious, a religion that Jesus brings are so different that when you try to put them together, it will, it will tear apart. It will rip apart. That's what Jesus is saying. So he's saying, look, your old ways, you're fasting for the old way. I'm instituting a new way. And you can't take this new way of doing things and put it into Judaism and think it will survive. It will not. It will either pull apart or it will burst. And both things will be worth nothing. They will all be thrown out. This does not mean, so this does not mean that Jesus was rejecting the Old Testament. Even though he's saying, look, you can't fit Christianity into the legal system, that it would never work. This didn't mean that Jesus was rejecting the Old Testament. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets not to reject them. What he repudiates then is not scripture, but the religious practices supposedly based on scripture. Jesus and the good news he preached wouldn't fit Pharisaical legalism, and therefore he and his followers would have to forge new ways of being faithful to God. Friends, what we learn from this passage is that fasting and feasting aren't ends in themselves, but are practices that are good when done in the right situation with the right motive. The disciples of John were looking to understand how it could be the followers of Jesus would not be feast or fasting. What they had yet to understand was that while Jesus was with them, that they should be feasting. New patterns and new ways of living were being ushered in because Jesus was no mere man, but the incarnate Son of God. Jesus had come to reset the world, to reset the way of doing things. Because the world, because of sin and death, had turned away from the right path of a perfect relationship with God, and now Jesus was there to restore it. So while everyone should have been feasting because the bridegroom was with them, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Jesus' disciples, knowing the truth of who Jesus was, were not fasting, but feasting. And most importantly, feasting on every word that came from God. They did this because the bridegroom was with them. But Jesus knew that the bridegroom would also be taken away. And that a time would come for his disciples to fast. We are in the age of fasting. We live in the age of fasting today. So should we fast? The answer is yes. I have not fasted in the last little while. 
makes me nervous to even think about going without a meal. When I started to think, honestly, guys, because I always have to preach to myself first, I'm thinking, okay, going out and choosing not to eat, it's almost a scary thing because we're so used to feasting. Should we fast? Yes, we should fast. But as mentioned earlier, not in some way. It's not a legalistic fast. Not in some way that has been practiced in the church in the past. It's not to gain some sort of goodwill with God so God will do what you want in return. Jesus encourages us to fast, not to meet our own ends, but so that we may center on God. Do you want to know God in a deeper, more personal way? If you do, fasting is one of the means by which God has instituted for you to do that. So if you're feeling dry spiritually and you want to experience God in a new special way, God says fasting is one of the ways to do it. Now, it's not just getting so busy with work you forget to eat. This is, I'm choosing, and I'm going to take that hour or that half hour where I would normally be eating, and I'm going to read my scriptures, I'm going to pray, I'm going to engage with God. That is a really hard thing to do. And all the things that control you in life and all the problems you have in life, I guarantee will come out in that half hour. If you dedicate it to God, if you just make it a dieting strategy, you won't have to worry about any of the spiritual ramifications. But if you do it for a spiritual reason, you'll notice you'll also be challenged but blessed. Through fasting, we're worshiping God. We're submitting to him. If we're not fasting unto God, then our fasting's legalism. And it's a failure. The words of Matthew 9, 14 to 17 make it clear that fasting is part of what Jesus wants us as believers, as disciples, to do. I think it's very important in preparation for the feasting that is about to come on Thanksgiving Day that we make room for some fasting even if it's just one meal. In this way, we can guard ourselves from the gluttony of our society, a society that never stops feasting and will therefore make room for feasting that does so to the glory of God. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you that you have given us many different means to be able to connect with you. Lord, the one that we use most often is prayer, and we thank you for that. Lord, help us to remember these other ones, things like fasting. Lord, help us, help us to have the courage to do and connect in with the disciplines that you've given to us. Lord, that we may grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is the giver of many good gifts. Wouldn't you agree? As we're coming up to this week, we are celebrating the abundance that God has given us. And uh, I've talked to some of the farmers that would say that this has been a good year uh, for uh, certain things. I think all of us would say that we have benefited from what God has given us. So in celebration, in preparation for celebrating the abundance, take one meal this week and decide to fast. And give that time as a celebration of, of your relationship with God and to connect with him in a deeper way. Amen.